Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Welcome to another sermon review where we look at the sermons, guys. We look at the sermons. We say, do they read the scriptures? Do they exegete the text? Do they mention the gospel of Jesus Christ? In case you are totally lost on what's going on, that was my impression of Francis Chan. Because that's who we're looking at today. We're looking at Francis Chan, a sermon called Unity in the Fear of God. And in case you're like, what is a sermon review? Why are you acting like Francis Chan? Well, the Francis Chan impression was free, but each week here on this channel, as a way to help believers use biblical discernment, we go through a sermon that you guys have suggested either in the comments or the DMs or via email. And Francis Chan is next up on the list, actually also highly requested. Now, as we get into this, uh, you can also obviously, as always, watch this sermon without my commentary. Link will be in the description below. But what is also in the description below is a free downloadable PDF of the sermon review notes that I use uh, for the sermons online and the sermons in person. This is a fresh copy, of course. I'm going to fill this out again as I do this one because I don't know where my last copy was that I did on this sermon. Watch this sermon through uh, two times through this time. But on this PDF, it has the questions that we ask each sermon. It's got some various notes, the type of sermon it is. Basically, it's just a guide. If you need a guide to help you kind of walk through sermons, this is a good starter guide. Again, it's free. So literally, you have nothing to lose at all. Nothing. Just it's a download. So that being said, let's go ahead and hop in. Let's go ahead and hop over to the uh, the the viewer here, the 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 uh, <laughs> the watcher. And we're going to hop into it, watching a sermon from Francis Chan called Unity and the Fear of God. Let's, uh, let, let's go ahead and uh, let's get going. Sometimes I, I want to squeeze in so much. Because I'm, I know that most of you your minds are going really fast. And we're going faster and faster. You're used to this. And oh, how come this guy didn't respond? How come, oh, what's going on here? What? And so you want to come up and go, hey, guys, man, isn't it great? We're here in San Diego. You know, and keep the energy up and go higher and higher and higher. But looking in Scripture, even if you look at the Old Testament temple, it was actually the opposite of the way they would structure things. You've got the outer courts. There's more noise there. But the closer and closer you get to the Holy of Holies, the more silent it is. And then the climax is for that high priest to walk into that Holy of Holies and just say nothing because you're in the presence of him. I and mean, can you imagine being in the holy of holies where God says my presence is going to show up on that mercy seat as you walk in and you are one human being in the presence of almighty God. And to think Right now, as we sit here, there's a being in heaven who is determining if he is going to give me another breath. Okay, so we always like to look off how, like, look at how these sermons start, right? So one of the things that I think is pretty apparent, you can hear it in the background, like there's dishes and silverware, just like, or cutlery, if you are uh, very civilized, but... Forks and spoons is what's happening. They're hitting the plates. So there seems to be like some sort of dinner that's happening. He's giving some sort of uh, sermon s sermon esque sort of uh, sermon at a dinner uh, is what it seems like. And so this sort of this is obviously an odd sort of sermon review in regards to the fact that we at least have to take that into account um, because this isn't like a church setting. Uh, who know there probably wasn't worship before this. This probably isn't a typical sort of prayer, worship, music, sermon, into worship music sort of thing. It seems to be somewhere maybe that he was invited to speak at, um, just because of the, the the fact that there seems to be a lot more going on behind, which sort of works 
in uh, opposition to what Francis is sort of trying to set up here, he's setting up this this picture of, hey, the Old Testament, the Holy of Holies, uh, it was the courtyard, it was a lot, it was noisy, it was loud, and then obviously the priest, the further you get in, the quieter it gets, the holier it gets, and then he's setting up this, hey, just as they were in front of, uh, of God in the Holy of Holies, we now here, as we sit here, and as he stands particularly, is what he's pointing out, that like, God is like, the one that controls if I even get another breath. So you have all this noise and all this things <laughs> happening in the background while Francis is on the other side trying to set up this this picture of like you realize even now like you are receiving grace from God because you can you can breathe now. So it's really kind of setting up um, this somberness, or he's trying to at least given the situation he's in, this somberness of like God is holy. God is overall even in this moment. Um, he's deciding to give us another breath. So we're, we're sort of setting, he, he's setting the tone seems to be from the beginning in regards to like a real, uh, realization of how holy God is and who God is. And all of us are dependent on Hashem, the name, the one for every breath and he's keeping us alive right now. And the thought that that God wants to be one with me. He says, I wanna dwell inside of you. See, we're used to thoughts like that. Like, oh, God is in me, guys. That is a crazy thought. I mean, when, when you think about the Old Testament and that God and, 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 and all they knew was this, this, this ark and this presence of God and you just touch it and you die. You don't walk into his presence. You know how crazy it was when they began to study the Virgin Mary? And go, you're telling me God himself is inside of her? No way. Did you know the early church referred to Mary as the ark? Because they're going, are you telling me God himself is in her womb, inside of a human being? Well, you're talking about the God that Moses walked up onto that mountaintop with the lightning and the fire and the thunder and the trumpets and the God who said, you can't look at my face and live. And now you're telling me the God who spoke the world into existence now came into this woman's womb. The presence of God in a person. Is, is anyone in here pregnant right now? Just out of curiosity. Do we have any pregnant women? No? Oh, do we have one? Okay, where are you? Do you mind standing up? Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, let's just imagine for a second. Let's say that's the Virgin Mary over there. Okay? Just imagine, let's say you live during the time of the Virgin Mary. Now, real quick, he's setting up, uh, just to follow along kind of with his sermon building, he sets up the Holy of Holies, how holy God is, um, and really sets this sort of, this preeminent idea that God is holy and he is the one that gives us her next breath and this is what happens. And then he uses that to sort of move into this idea uh, as an example, I mean, he uses Mary as an example saying, hey, the early church, as they started really looking at Mary, they called her the ark, you know, the one that carried the Messiah. Uh, and there's a lot to that. It's very, um, it's, it's interesting, I guess, first of all, to hear uh, Chan kind of talk about that, because this is where you start getting some of the theology of, you know, the perpetual virginity of Mary. This is where you start sort of getting the holiness of Mary. Like, there's a lot of theology that comes along with this idea that as a Protestants, we'd be like, ah, not super helpful, not also super biblical. Um, but so you have sort of, you can sort of tell that he's, um, 
maybe read some early church history on it, but he's also kind of holding that up a little bit in regards to like the holiness of Mary. In fact, he's going to mention, I, I don't want to kind of like give you too much ahead of what he's going to say here, but he really does seem to have this very high view of Mary uh, from sort of a Catholic view. Now, again, we're looking particularly at this sermon and we're using Francis Chan as an example. So this isn't really a, a, a review of Francis Chan as much as it is an example of this type of preaching using Francis Chan as an example. But that being said, I know that, you know, people have been pretty critical of Francis Chan over for um, some of his uh, unity views on Catholicism and then some of it on charismatics and Pentecostalism. We'll get into that a little bit because he does touch on it in this sermon, but just to give you sort of a, uh, a kind of a window into why he maybe is even using Mary as an example again, because uh, of probably a lot of the maybe early church slash, you know, Roman Catholic writings on Mary. So he uses uh, the Virgin Mary as an example saying, Hey, you know, God chooses to dwell with us now in us now. And then he uses Mary as an example of that dwelling in us. Now it's a little bit different, obviously, right? Jesus dwelling in Mary versus the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. That's two totally different things. Uh, but he doesn't really differentiate that very much. And that's something that like I would note down is that it's like, okay, that's, is that the same thing or is that a different thing? Is Jesus, um, you know, becoming, is God putting on flesh in the, you know, in, in the incarnation, is that the same thing as the Holy Spirit dwelling in us as believers now? And that'd be a no, it's, it's different. But he uses that sort of in his example um, to, to, to kind of keep his sermon going to get to the point that he's trying to get to. So let's listen to sort of how he takes this, because the next little bit does have like sort of a, um, a Catholic flair to it, I guess I would say. So just listen for that. And let's say you knew that the God of the universe was in her womb. How would you treat her? Can you imagine the respect, the honor we would give to her? Like, I don't care what she does, if she threw her cheesecake at me, whatever, I would just be like, it's okay, it's okay, I like it. You know, it's just, I mean, you're talking the God of the universe is in her womb. You know, take my seat, take my car, take, it, take whatever. I, my creator is in her womb. The, the amount of respect, regardless of what she does, right? We'd be terrified to do anything offensive toward her. Do we believe the scriptures that Christ is in me right now? Do we believe the scriptures that the Holy Spirit of God dwells within believers? So if we believe that this holy God dwells inside of others who know Christ, how dare we slander and divide some of the things that are written by fellow Christians against other Christians, I'm just like, what in the world? So this is where he sort of gets into the unity and fear of God, right? So he's setting up this, uh, at the beginning, the holiness of God, using the temple as an example, but then shifts into Mary had Jesus in her. And like, if you contemplate that and use that as an example, then wouldn't you treat her differently because you know the Son of God is in her womb? And then he kind of juxtaposes that and says, well, in a very similar and like way, believers have the Holy Spirit in them, and therefore we should show that same amount of respect to other believers that have the Spirit in them as we would show Mary, uh, you know, when she was pregnant with Jesus. I think there's a lot of different problems with this example. Um, now, again, I do want to say, I don't think we're going to, we, we don't, and not, I don't think, I, I know we don't get a ton of scripture in this talk. And I don't want to, I don't want to be incredibly critical of that because again, because of the setting that this seems to be set in, it's not what you would have as traditional like church service. So I want to make sure that that tone is set. Like we understand that, but in the same way, uh, and then, you know, same sort of criticism that we have here is that if we're going to make statements like the Holy Spirit's in us and Christ is in us and 
those sorts of things, or even the example of the Holy Holies before, like to give people examples of that by pointing back to specific parts in scripture, I think would be incredibly helpful, even in this setting, because somebody, if they don't, if, if they do happen to be in this setting, because it's not a church setting, we can't, I mean, who knows what kind of people are in here? Have they been to church? Do they go to church regularly? Have they never been to church? Is this new to them? Is this familiar to them? To give them references um, is very helpful. That's why, for example, if uh, it's been a long time since I did it, but if I do go to like uh, like a community event where I'm asked to to give a presentation or like an F like Fellowship of Christian Athletes, go to that right. Uh, I try to whenever I give those speeches to give references. Um, to the verses or points that I'm sort of pointing to, because I don't know what kind of churches those kids go to, or if they go to church at all, or if they're just part of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, because they want to be, right? I want to give references, so if they have questions, um, those references are available to them. And I think that would be helpful here. Now, aside from that altogether, I think the sort of logical sort of argument that he's building doesn't, doesn't hold up incredibly well. Okay. He's assuming that talking or correcting someone is slander uh, toward them, and we shouldn't slander other uh, people that have the Holy Spirit in them. Um, which, again, there, we, we do have verses in which slander is a sin. I think that would be helpful to point out, which he doesn't. But just so you can sort of see the build. Mary had Jesus inside of her when she was pregnant. Therefore, like, wouldn't we treat her differently? And then the Holy Spirit's in us. And therefore, if the Holy Spirit's in us as believers, wouldn't we treat each other as we would have treated Mary if we were there at the time that she was pregnant with Jesus? I get where he's going with it. I just think it's a kind of a faulty, um, sort of a faulty example um, for a number of different reasons. I hope that I've made those clear, but let's, let's let him kind of play this out a little bit longer. Um, but that's one of the things I noticed. Also totally unrelated to the sermon review. If you are a video viewer, um, this podium, I don't know what it's made of, but it's nothing sturdy. Like he, this thing is shaking the entire time. And I get that Francis is like very animated, but this thing, I was worried it was going to fall apart the whole time. Let's get back to it. Do we not fear him? Scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I grew up in a time when uh, that's when the churches started to stop talking about the fear of God. Because we're all about getting people in the doors. And so you think what type of message will attract people to the church? And so we're all thinking about ways to attract the crowds into our churches. So topics like judgment and the fear of God, they're just lost. No one wants to hear about that. We're going to talk about raising a happy family, having a successful life, how you know, God can provide for this, provide for that. Let's, let's talk about these things. Let's, let's not talk about Judgment Day. Let's not talk about standing before this terrifying God that we'll all have to answer to. Let's talk about things that attract people. But the problem with that is the Bible says the foundation was supposed to be fear. The fear of the Lord. You know, that's why he didn't send Isaiah out until Isaiah understood who was sending him out. Just in the same way that he silenced Job and his friends who thought they understood. They needed to be silenced. And understand, that the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But it also says that the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. It's not just the beginning. Our friendship with God is built upon this foundation. The reason why so many people walk away from the faith and make some of these foolish choices is because they didn't have a foundation of the fear of the Lord. Okay, so there's a couple things here. There's actually quite a bit here. Um, two of the things, so he mentions the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, so uh, Proverbs 9 Verse 10 specifically is what he's referencing, but again, he doesn't reference that, so we don't know. Um, 
and he doesn't really preach from it. He's just referencing it, but he's setting up this idea that God is holy, uh, obviously, and then uses Mary as the example of, hey, the respect we would show her is the same respect we should show any individual with the fear of the, uh, with the, the Holy Spirit in them, but we slander them, and we probably don't respect them and slander them because we don't fear the Lord and the fact that the, that the Holy Spirit is in them. So slandering others demonstrates that we don't fear the Lord very well, and then he shifts to sort of explaining the fear of the Lord, right? Because his whole point is here, we should have unity with one another. I mean, I'm sort of skipping ahead, but we'll see this. We have, should have unity with one another, as in brothers and sisters that have the spirit inside of them. But we don't have unity because we slander them, but we slander them because we don't fear the Lord. That's the general gist here that he's building out. Referencing a few of the different uh, examples, right? So he references the Proverbs 9, verse 10. He references Isaiah's word. Isaiah is like, send me. Uh, but that whole thing before that is Isaiah understands that he is uh, he's a man of unclean lips living amongst the people of unclean lips, right? And he understands the holiness of God when he's in the presence of God, That just how that is. Then we have the entire story of Job, right? Where Job, um, God has to, I mean, the whole last few chapters, I forget exactly how many it is, but if you go to the end, like eventually, like he, God shows Job everything. I created this. I created that. I created this. Like, did you do any of that? And no, you didn't, Job. And then after Job's like, wow, no, you're right. Like God takes him on another thing where he's like, you didn't do this. You didn't do this. I did all of this. And then Job, you know, says the line, uh, something along the lines of, um, I, I, I once, uh, knew you, or I thought I knew you, but now I really know you. I forget exactly the line that it is. Um, but the idea is like, I thought I knew who God was, but now that I've seen all that you've done, like I really know you. And this is sort of the tone that, that Chan's obviously trying to set up, right? This idea that we don't fear God and there's things that come out of that fear of God uh, as a result, one of which is that we don't slander others that bear God's name, that, that have the spirit inside of them. But another thing that he sort of touches on here that he won't go into a lot of detail on, but I think is important, especially as we talk about deconstruction and all of that sort of thing, is that he says those that have left the church and you know make make the decision to do that do so because they don't have a foundation uh, of this knowledge of the fear of the Lord, and there will be people that obviously will push back against that. But I I would say like here I think he's got a point. This whole fear thing in general, the fear of the Lord, this respect for the Lord, right, uh, is really I mean if you're looking at that word in particular, it really boils down to this respect. And there is, when you have respect for someone, there is this fear built in there with it, that they have power, they they are uh, over you, and therefore can do things. And um, so what he's saying here is that like, hey, there's people that leave the faith, but that's because they didn't have this foundational fear of the Lord. They didn't understand who God is, much like, I mean, he's referencing, you know, Isaiah and Job. Um, they didn't get it. They don't get who God is. And when you don't understand the fear of the Lord, um, if you don't have respect for him, then it's easy to, in the first example that he gives, slander other people that have the, you know, Holy Spirit. And the second result on the other end of it, sort of what he alludes to here, is that it's, it's easy to leave uh, leave the Lord because you don't actually know who he is. So there's a lot being built out here. Um, okay, yeah, I don't want to skip too far ahead. So let, let's let him keep going. Because I don't feel like loving all the time. I don't feel like following all the time. But at the core of who I am, there's a fear of God. That is a foundational truth. And that's been lost. And it's, and it's so hard because for the last few decades, we have not been preaching that. And yet there's all these people who say they believe in Jesus. And, and yet it's, you know, the more the world, you know, gets their thoughts into these people, they just start bending towards the world. Why? Because they don't know what he is like. They've never imagined standing before him at the end of their lives. And so... It's been a challenge these last few years. I mean, great things are happening. We see a young crowd that is so on fire for the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, we were in Kansas City at the Send event where we're sending out, yes, and uh, thanks to you, many of you guys supported that event, and we had like 40,000 young people that are ready to be sent to the ends of the earth anywhere the gospel has not been preached. Very exciting. When we were in Brazil, we had over 100,000 show up. 
and we're heading to Norway in a couple weeks. And um, so it's a very exciting time, but it's almost like we're having to reteach. It's almost like we built this house and realized, oh, we forgot the foundation. Okay, so real quick, just to touch on it. So this is where it goes to the other side of, um, you know, his unity with more of like charismatic Pentecostal believers. So um, I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail of like Francis Chan history with theology. But one thing that I think is interesting to know, right? And whenever t you hear, I've said before, whenever a pastor maybe uses a quote from a pastor or a theologian, it's always good to note that down because that gives them sort of, that gives you an idea of where theologically they may be coming from or what sort of influencing their thought process. Now, we all have that. We all have people that influence our, our theology and our thought process. But the sin, for example, is a charismatic um, sort of Pentecostal conference on evangelism and the Great Commission fulfillment, essentially. Some of the people that are there are Todd White, uh, Christine Kane, Mike Bickle, um, for as far as worship, there are people like Cody uh, Carnes, Carrie Job. Um, then you have, let me see if there's any other speakers in particular that I recognize. Heidi Baker. Um, some of these are the bigger names there. Rick Patino. So yeah, there, there's there's a bunch of different uh, speakers there. Now I've done I've done sermon reviews on Tide White. I've done sermon reviews on Christine Kane. Um, I've heard of Heidi Baker. Like. Here's where I would say, like, when you hear people mention, hey, these are the people I support, these are the people I hang out with, not that you find guilt by association, but you do have to say, okay, well, these are the sort of people that they're at least semi-endorsing by by going to the conference or standing on the same stage as, right? And if you were to watch the Christine Kane sermon review, the, uh, the Todd White sermon review, both of those were pretty bad. Um, not... From, and this isn't even talking about theology. It's just talking about scripture presentation. It's talking about being faithful to the scripture they're preaching from. That's my concern, um, is, is being faithful to the text that you're preaching from. And both of those were, in my humble opinion, terrible. But you can find those in the playlist if you, if you have time to watch those after this one. My point is that, uh, and some of the criticism that Francis Chan has gotten is from hanging out with those people, semi-endorsing those people. So... Um, not that I want to make this video about that, but I do want to point out that as you're listening to sermons, if there is a quote mentioned or some sort of association mentioned, just note that down because that at least helps you understand, okay, these are the people that are sort of influencing this individual. These are the, the, you know, the old dead guys that they're reading and they're quoting from that are influencing them as well. And that gives you a better sort of perspective and lens in which to understand, um, the ways in which the person speaking is processing some some of the finer points of theology, secondary issues, things like that. So that being said, with this whole unity thing, what we've heard so far, if we're paying attention and taking notes, is that Francis seems to have a bit of a leaning toward uh, sort of this unity with a little bit of Catholicism. Not a lot, but he has mentioned, you know, Mary held her pretty high up there, even if it was just an example. And then here we see sort of this unity with uh, Pentecostal charismatic sort of teachers. And so there seems to be some unity in, in that direction as well. So I don't want to say too much more about it because it doesn't have a lot to do with this, this sermon speech review that he's given. Um, but I do think it's at least important to, to point out because that does matter. Like that does influence you. The people you read and listen to and put stock in does, does influence you. And that does matter. And you do need to pay attention to that. Not only in the pastors you listen to in your own life, and just be aware of that. So let's keep going. The fear of the Lord. We forgot to tell you who you're worshiping and how the Bible, you ever try to put a foundation in a building after it's been built? That's really what we're doing in the church. And I think a lot of this division and this fighting goes back to, you don't fear the fact that Jesus dwells with me. You don't honor me like you would honor the Virgin Mary. You don't realize you'll have to answer for every careless word. Now, I don't want to keep stopping a thousand times, but I think that's an important point to sort of dig into and think about. The assumption here 
that he seems to be making is that if you slander someone or and again, he's automatically dropping to slander, but we'll go with disagreement and then talk about or sort of uh, come up against, then you don't understand the fear of God, because if you understood the fear of God, then you would not talk about push back on or slander individual X, Y, Z that says that, you know, they're a believer as well. And you clearly don't love or fear God if you do that. It's his, his, his assumption here. I would push back on that a bit and say that there, there are individuals. Part, part of the reason we do these sermon reviews is the same reason, is that the reason you push back on some of these teachers that, uh, you know, a, a variety of the teachers we've looked at, the reason you sort of question that push back a little bit, dig into it a bit, is because you do fear the Lord and you do love the Lord and you don't want people to have a misunderstanding of, of the word of God or a misunderstanding of who God is or how he operates, because that does downstream have like a lot of implications. And therefore you want to, you do want to push back a little bit and say, Hey, you maybe need to look a little bit more into pastor so-and-so or pastor, you know, over here, because they're not staying super close to orthodoxy. And they're, they're a little unclear on, you know, some of the more important points of theology. And that wouldn't be slander as much as it would be just being like, hey, look into them. Again, one of the things I try to say uh, over and over and over again as we do these sermon reviews is that I'm not saying any of these pastors we've looked at aren't believers. Um, I, I would say that some of them shouldn't be pastors. I'm not saying that about Francis Chan particularly in this moment. I'm just saying if you look back, there's definitely some people we've reviewed that don't fit the gift set of pastor. They just fit the gift set of good communicator. Uh, and then they've been put in that role as pastor. So I'm not saying you question everyone's, you know, salvation. You don't know their heart. Only God knows their heart. But what you can do is push back a little bit and say, is what they're saying, does that make sense? Does it line up? I think we have a lot of Apollos Apollos is out here and not a lot of, uh, of, of people, you know, pulling them aside and teaching them, uh, the ways of the Lord more rightly, right? We don't have a lot of that. Um, and so you have a lot of people that are very gifted and very, um, charismatic and very like passionate about telling people about Jesus, but there's nobody, uh, pulling them aside and being like, Hey, you know, here, here's, here's the finer points. Here's some church history. Here's, you know, where we've, you know, the church has agreed for thousands of years on this particular thing in orthodoxy. So I think we have to be a little bit more nuanced than, Hey, if you slander them, you don't fear God. Um, so he, he does sort of build this out a little bit later. So I don't want to hammer him on this, but I do think that we need to, to push back a little bit on points like this. So I'm going to try, I promise I'm going to try to let him uh, get a little bit further before I pause this again. See, God made some promises. And I, I first of all, I love, um, I love the time that we're living in um, because even all the things that have been said about the church lately, I feel like the Lord is doing something where he's disciplining the church. Um, He's exposing the church. And see, he made some promises. Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 25, he promises that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So this is a promise. He goes, I promise you, if a kingdom is divided, it will not stand. This is the word of God. This is when Jesus was accused of, you know, casting out a demon by Beelzebub. He goes, that doesn't make any sense. Everyone knows a kingdom divided against itself will not stand. And for years, for centuries, the church has been dividing more and more and more. And God says, it's not going to stand. That type of kingdom is going to crumble. And we're seeing that. And we're seeing, you know, at one point, all of this branding and these different denominations, everyone's so proud of their denominations, but we're living in a time where people don't want to be called evangelical anymore. Who wants to be called Roman Catholic right now? Or Southern Baptist right now? 
and all of these names and all of these factions. I'm going, Lord, it just seems like you're bringing down all of these names. And you promised we wouldn't stand this way, but it feels like something new is arising. Okay, so a couple things. I think it's important. Let's let's go ahead and just look at that. I don't have it to where I have it to be able to pull up on the screen for you to read here, but you can turn to it if you want. Matthew chapter 12, we'll start at verse 22 because that's actually where the um, the actual thing starts, right? So, then a demon-possessed man uh, who was bl blind and mute was brought to him, him being Jesus, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But the but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that a man this man cast out the demons. And knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom uh, do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Um, and then he goes down quite a bit more in example, and you should read all that as well. Now, to Francis's credit, he does mention the sort of the background context of this, but this isn't set up as a promise. This is set up as a duh sort of moment where Jesus is like, how, if you're, if you're claiming that I'm casting out by Beelzebub, how, the logic doesn't stand. If, if a kingdom is divided, it won't, it, there's no way it can continue because it's now in two pieces, right? Um, so the, there's a lot here that we could dig into that we're not going to get into. We don't have time to get into, but I do just want to make, there is a difference between a promise that God makes in scripture versus just a statement. And one of the statements he's making to the Pharisees here that say, well, clearly this is, you know, you're doing it by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus just makes a statement like, if that's the case, how in the world, like you can't have a kingdom split in two. If you say that I am doing things in the power of, if I'm here because of Beelzebub, and then I do cast out demons in the power of Beelzebub, Satan against Satan, how's that work? Right? All he's doing is making a statement. Um, and then Francis uses that as an example to say, hey, the church is super divided as well. And if we're divided, God promises that we won't stand, which isn't true. This isn't what the, that's not what the passage is alluding to. Um Jesus is making the statement that if a kingdom is divided, the logical end is that it's not going to work. That's The kingdom can't be divided and still continue. And then Francis uses that as an example to say, we'll see the Protestant church is splintered off into all these denominations. And so clearly we can't stand because we're all divided. And God is now bringing that down because nobody wants to be called these things. And he's bringing us back to sort of this unity is the example that he basically gives. Now, the fault in that is a couple things. Uh, he does rightly a little bit further back talk about how the seeker sensitive music movement, um, there were certain topics they just didn't talk about, one of them being the fear of God and saying that, you know, the result of not talking about that and not teaching about that has led to a bunch of people declaring to be Christians that don't even know the God they worship. That there was a great point. Now, in like manner, what where we're at now, as far as denominations, most people cannot tell you the distinctives of their denomination, right? They can't tell you the difference between Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and Wesleyans. Like they just don't know. Like what are the distinctives? This is why non-denominational churches really took off, not only because of the secret sensitive movement, but because they just said, hey, we're going to sort of leave those secondary issues for you to decide. We're not going to really teach on them a whole lot. And they sort of, it was a movement away from denominations, which was why it was called non-denominational, because denominations have a very rigid structure of, if you're over here, we believe X, Y, Z, and over here, they believe X, Y, Z. A, a pr pretty predominant one, for example, that you may have heard of recently is Pre Presbyterians and Baptists in regards to baptism, uh, what that looks like, who does get baptized, what baptism means. Um, those are a little bit of a distinction there, right? There's even more of a distinction between like uh, Methodist and Baptist in regards to sort of, you know, how does God work out salvation? Do you have a part in it? Do you not have a part in it? What, you know, percentage of a part do you have in it? 
And a lot of people, and this is sort of what Francis is doing here, is dogging on that and being like, see, nobody wants that anymore. Nobody, we're all divided on that and nobody wants that. That's a really oversimplification. Not that I want to be some champion for denominations over here, but the reason denominations are there is because we differ on secondary issues, right? For example, there are Baptist churches that say women can't be elders, right? They hold the scripture on that. And then we have people over in like the Methodist um, sort of denomination cycle group that would say women can be pastors and they, they bring their scripture forward for it. And this is a secondary issue, though it's it's more between a first and secondary issue, sort of a middle there. But the idea here is that there's reasons why. So to say like, hey, we all need to just let those go. You know, the baptism thing, not important. We can all be, you know, we can just worship together. Well, baptism is a pretty important sacrament, guys. So how you view that working is important, right? And I think it's not that people say, I don't want to be a part of this denomination anymore, so we should get rid of them. I think really it's just a, it's a misunderstanding of what your denomination even stands for. I am hard pressed to find anyone that can tell me what their denomination believes. I mean, truly, there's hardly anybody that can tell me what their denomination believes. And I think this, though this isn't his point in particular, um, I think he's seeing a problem and maybe coming at it with the wrong answer. That's just me. Anyway, long drawn out speech from me on denominations, but this is what he's getting at saying, I think, I think he's misapplying the house divided cannot stand and applying it to denominations in a way that contextually doesn't make sense within what Jesus was saying. Let's get back to it. Because he also promised in Philippians chapter one in verse 27, that was a cue for the verse so I could read it. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition but to you of salvation and that from God. So here's a promise from God. He goes, if you would stand firm, stand fast in one spirit with one mind and you strive together for the gospel and you're not afraid at all by your adversaries, he goes, that's proof to them of their destruction. That's crazy. God says, if you would be united. And he goes, if you'd be united, it would prove to them their destruction, their perdition, their judgment. And it would prove to them that you are actually saved. See, when I read that verse, I go, gosh, that doesn't make logical sense to me. You know, I like math. Duh, Asian. But... Uh, you, you just, so I like, I just go, okay, two plus two is four. You know, here's an equation. And I go, well, why would the unity of the church prove to an unbeliever their destruction? That's an equation that doesn't make sense in my mind. But I go, well, wait, but it's the word of God. And the word of God tells me, he promises me, if you guys are going to be divided, it's going to crumble. You come together, it's going to prove to the world that you're saved. This is the equation God's given us. And many of us have tried to use our own logic going, well, I know what will get people in the church. I know what will save our country. Well, God already told us what would, what would work. He says, when you come together and you strive together as one, when you bear with one another, when you treat each other with honor like you would anyone who houses the Holy Spirit of God and have that reverence for them. Okay, so another thing I think is very important when we talk, when he, especially when he brings out text. So first, so Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, 28, what he's read, but it's really referring back to what happened earlier in that chapter. And I think that's important to note. All of these letters are written contextually. 
but obviously have application for the believer today. But what's happening in Philippi, right? If you go back to, I guess, verse 12, we could go back to, and it says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole uh, Imperial Guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak without fear. Some indeed, and then here's the point that it points back to, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, uh, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict, afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in, or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And then, you know, referring back when he talks about unity. Now, a couple of things that are incredibly important here. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of confusion fusion maybe in what he's talking about. Now, to be clear, he does clear this up, I think, a little bit later. I just want to make sure that we we have the minds and discernment to say, just because it, um, you know people push back against us or we push back against others that are believers, there is a fine line between me saying, you're not a believer and slandering someone versus saying, hey, I think that we could do this better. And I think there's a better way to do this and sort of pushing back, you know, saying, hey, uh, you know, maybe your your orthodoxy here's a little off. Maybe your teaching here's a little off. Um, I actually, I encourage that. I want that to be done so that we can be better. We see this in the early church as well. Whenever, I mean, they're pushing back and forth pretty hard on each other's a lot of these fights are seen, you know, during the councils and when these creeds are being created and these belief systems are being found, you know, being sort of solidified is that there's a lot of, you know, very um, strong words used because they want to get this right. And I think that's what you see now in some ways, whenever Christians are, um, seem combative, but are just really contending for the faith. There are very few arguments I see online uh, or in person that, though I see a majority of them online, that are done purely out of malice. Most of them are simply saying, hey, there is this theological issue that is important, and I think maybe we should look into that a little bit more, and maybe you're not doing a great job of that. And oftentimes, and I think this is where the problem is, oftentimes instead of saying, maybe you're right, And looking into that, we have this defense reflex that says, no, you're wrong. You're stupid. You're not even a Christian either. And that's where I think maybe he's kind of honing in on is that whenever, um, if we believe the other person's a believer, there is a certain way to approach them. And we've seen that on Twitter a lot lately. There's a way to approach someone um, that says, let's kind of talk through this uh, in 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 a biblical way and not slander each other. Um, not going to get a whole lot more into that because this review is already going to be super long. Um, but anyway, I, I think it's a misuse again of Philippians when he talks about this, because this is talking about a specific church having unity, even with those that are preaching in spite of Paul being in prison. Um, and then connecting it back to, I think a bigger misuse of Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, but let's keep going. Years ago, I was, um, my son was in Little League. He was like nine or 10 years old. And uh, I was just one of the dads. I wasn't coaching at that point. Um, and this play happened where his buddy got onto first base, but everyone was arguing. It was 12-12. And uh, my son's up to bat. And I'm just like, Real quick, I just want to warn you, I'm not going to break in, but this is a pretty long story, so just kind of prep for that. Like, looking at him like, son, this is your moment. You know, like, you you get to come home as a man today. All you got to do is just get a hit. We win the game. Meanwhile, everyone starts arguing about whether the guy was safe on first base. Pretty soon, everyone starts swearing at each other. These are adults screaming F-bombs left and right. And I'm just kind of stunned, like, what is happening here? And then they start calling each other out to fight. And now full-grown men start brawling 
at this nine-year-old baseball game. And I'm just watching going, what is happening here? But I kind of froze. I didn't know what to do. You know, I'm just another dad. It's not like they know who I am. Pretty soon, it gets like the police come, a guy broke his leg, ambulances. It was the most embarrassing thing I'd seen. And, you know, then they were going to cancel the league. I'm like, no, 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 don't cancel it. Just kick out everyone you need to that was involved, all the parents and kids, whatever. Give me the worst kids of every team, and I'll, I'll build up another team. I'm like, okay, okay, we'll do that. And um, but I remember that night going, gosh, what could I have done to stop that? You know, because I just, I relived it over and over because these kids are traumatized. They are crying. You've got these nine-year-old, ten-year-old kids crying, going, what just happened? That's my dad going away in an ambulance. I came here to play baseball, and it turns into this brawl. And I just kept going, why didn't I do something? Why didn't I say something? And I relived that a lot, and I realized I could have stopped that if I wanted it bad enough. I could have. I mean, because imagine that's going on, and what if I just screamed at the top of my lungs, ran to, you know, the pitcher's mound, and started throwing dirt in my face, and just acting like a lunatic, and then once I got everyone's attention, I was said, what are you guys doing? They're nine. Come on, stop thinking. I could have gotten their attention. I could have stopped that fight. I am convinced I could have if I wanted it bad enough. And, and so when I think about my life right now, when I was thinking about you guys and the influence you have and everything else, we know that God in heaven, almighty him, Hashem, the name, the one we're all going to stand before. We know he wants all believers at one table. I've looked at Catholic priests and I go, there's no way you can tell me that God is happy with this. That you having the spirit of God and believing I have the spirit of God, but we can't take of the same communion table. There's no way you can tell me, yeah, that's God's plan. He wanted 30 different tables for his family to sit in. Let's think about what he went through on the cross. Why? So that we could become perfectly one. And there are so many days I think, yeah, but what am I going to do? How am I going to change that? Okay, so obviously gives the example of the story as far as, um, well, he's not done with the story, but I do want to interject really quick before this point pause, like passes. His, his statement here is that uh, God doesn't want 30 different tables for his kids to sit at. He wants them all at one table, and there needs to be a unity in that. There seems to be an assumption here um, that he doesn't really get into in this sermon. He makes a differentiation here in a minute, but here he doesn't, in which like he's assuming that denominations within Protestantism are sitting at different tables. And that's not... I think the better example is we're all in the cafeteria of faith. <laughs> like this, if you, if you believe in the foundational truths of scripture in regards to Jesus is the son of God, you believe in the Trinity, uh, you believe in, um, you know, the, the, the Jesus uh, died on the cross to save us from our sins and that he rose in defeat of sin and death, that he's coming back again. Like the foundational beliefs of who Jesus is and what he did and what that meant then you're in this cafeteria of faith. And within the cafeteria of faith, if we're going to go with this whole analogy, there are a bunch of different tables, but at these different tables are different secondary issues. It's not like you're not in the same building, all right? Uh, or in the same room. There is this, you know, this cafeteria that, that says, okay, the easiest way to put this that people are not going to like, but one of the easiest ways to put this is like the, the Apostles' Creed, Okay. Do you believe in the, uh, you know, what the Apostles' Creed states, right? And again, the Apostles' Creed is not infallible. It is not, you know, scripture, but it pulls from scripture. 
Everything in the Apostles' Creed pulls from Scripture. It points back to the Word of God. So let's, you know, it goes to the Father being the creator of all things, right? Jesus being his Son. And it does, again, mention the unity of believers. This, this, if you believe in Jesus and follow Jesus, there's this unity that you have with brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's just use that. The cafeteria of faith being the Apostles' Creed. And within the cafeteria, you have different denominations. You have Baptists, you have Presbyterians, you have Methodists, you have Wesleyans, you have uh, Pentecostals. So again, and he will, he will state this in a minute, there are things worth dividing over. I would say at base, you know, those foundational beliefs of the church are worth splitting from. So if you say, I think I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in the things the Apostle Creed states, I'm going to have some questions for you. Okay, uh, which again was the whole reason for the Apostles' Creed and the creeds that came after it were to set some sort of boundary for Christian belief. This is what means to be in. This is what it means to be out in a way that we can, you know, sort of quantify. And so, what you have here, a lot of people don't like that, but that's what you have, and that's what they're for. And so, Francis's analogy here of a bunch of different tables only works if you assume that. Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists and Anglicans don't believe in the same Jesus. That's not the point. Like that's they foundationally giving a lot of grace here. We, they all believe in the same Jesus. It's the secondary kind of things that the working out of what that looks like within the local church, right? There's some congregationally led churches. There's some elder led churches. These are all secondary things doesn't mean you're outside of the faith and you're not in unity with other brothers and sisters. It just means there are different secondary views that you have um, that scripture, you know, isn't not necessarily fuzzy on, but you can get, but depending on, you know, maybe your contextual situation, it looks a little differently. And within the New Testament, we have enough kind of give there that we can sort of play with that a bit. Um I just want to clarify that, like the way he's setting it up. And I think we could have a whole conversation on Catholicism and Protestantism and what that looks like. Uh, we just don't have, that's a whole history lesson that to be frank, I'm not even probably qualified to talk about so much. And hopefully one day we can have somebody on that does that, but that's a whole different discussion. But the idea here is that he's, he's sort of making this assumption that we're all not unified when it's the secondary things we're not unified on. It's the primary things we are. So I think we're making, he seems to be making this a much bigger deal than it actually is and seems to be saying, hey, the fights we have on the secondary issues, those are problems when they're not really problems. They're more of us really fleshing out what he mentioned earlier with the secret sense of music movement where we're like, there's just people that don't know what their denomination believes and now they're kind of going to fisticuffs about it, which is also still sort of healthy healthy, lively discussion on secondary issues is good. It helps people sort of find out what they really do believe and why they really do believe it. Um, it's helped me tremendously figure out what, you know, where I stand on certain secondary things in ways that I, I would have otherwise come to because somebody pushed me on it and I had to figure it out. Um, anyway, I just want to make that, that point. Now, he's still continuing the story and the analogy here. Let's let him do that. And then I, I think back to that baseball game. I go, no. What I don't want is to come to the end of my life and realize maybe if I screamed loud enough, I could have brought us back to one table. Maybe if I begged you guys to think about what God desires, that we all start raising our voices and saying, this isn't right. If that person, if that woman has the spirit of God in her, I better be careful with my speech. Because 1 Corinthians 3 says that we are the temple of God. And if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. What I love right now, I think we have the best opportunity we've ever had, at least in my lifetime towards unity and I think some of us have just, have just accepted the fact that we're so divided and we can't put these denominations back together but let me remind you 
that the first thousand years after Christ's death, there was one church. It wasn't until 1054 that we split into two, and then three, and now thousands. Mutually exclusive t- tables. And I actually believe that this is the best time we've ever had in our lifetimes to see the church come back together and strive side by side for the sake of the gospel. And I'm not talking about at the expense of truth. I am not talking about at the expense of holiness. Anyone who's heard me preach knows those are things that are very dear to me. But I'm just saying we've lost the importance of unity and we're going to lose if we're divided. God promised that. And we will win if we come together. Okay, so it looks like we have about seven minutes left to this sermon. Um, But let's kind of stop on this point real quick. So, like, just to re-sort of talk about what he's already said and then bring in this last point. So his last point was he's not saying that we should unite um, and ignore truth. Right. So he does acknowledge that there is a reason to not be in unity with someone. Uh, But he points all the way back to the schisms of the church. So where we have like, you know, the Eastern split off from the Western church. And then we have more schisms after that as well. I interviewed a a, a PhD student from England about the schisms, like a very broad 3000 foot view of it. I will link that in the description, though. And I think it's important to talk about those schisms and understand them as best we can, because all of these breaks were all breaks about the person of Jesus, right? How does, you know, who is Jesus? How does divinity work out? What does that mean? Um, where, you know, who, who does Jesus come from? Like the father, is he already are always begotten? Like there's these discussions that are very very wide, meaty discussions that have been had that because, as Francis has already talked about, we just, we didn't talk about things for a long time. We didn't teach people church history. And now everyone's just like, I don't know. And there's, there's a lot to catch up on. It's like going to a new school at the last semester and you're expected to take the test that everyone else has studied for the whole time. You're like, I don't even know. And I don't even know where to begin. Right. Um, One of the places that I would suggest, I've said this a thousand times, I'll say it again, Nick Needham's book, 2,000 Years of Christ's Power, great place to start. Um, I'll link that in the description below as well. Because what happens is we oversimplify, and I think that's what Francis is doing here. Like, I, I admire the guy. I really loved back in college, Crazy Love. Like, I appreciate what Francis Chan has done. I just think here there is an oversimplification of what is actually happening. Um, he is equating division and maybe he's seeing something that I'm just not seeing. Maybe you see something I don't see. Love to hear from me in the comment section. But what he seems to be seeing is that the, the discussions that maybe are happening in person or online that are arguments, he's seeing those as like divisive things that are bad. And we're having those because we don't fear the Lord. I don't think I agree with that at all. I think these discussions that I see people having in person and then definitely having online are discussions that are important discussions to have. Some of those are discussions that can be really, really lively. But at the end of the day, you know, we ha- we high five, we hug, we say, I disagree with you, brother. I disagree with you, sister. But I still know that you love Jesus, even though we disagree on these things that aren't foundational faith things. Then... There are foundational faith things where we argue adamantly about, and I just go, look, I'm praying for you. I, I don't think you're a brother, but I pray that you are, but I'm going to fight you on this foundational thing, right? My, one of mine in particular, if you say, you know, I don't believe in some of the statements of the Apostles' Creed, I'm going to press you on that. Um, because not that the Creed is, is some sort of inspired thing, but it points back to the inspired scriptures. Um, and that's where it, it pulls the, the, the truths that are stated in that creed. That's where it pulls them from. It's from scripture. So if you say, you know, I'm going to press you on that a little bit. Um, I think he sees that as disunity when that's really striving for unity in a very structured sense. 
Um, so I appreciate that he says there are things worth dividing over. There are truths that are worth dividing over. He doesn't say what they are. Um, but he seems to think even denominational splits are problematic. And to, to admit, they, they can be. If it gets to the point where you say only Baptist, only Presbyterians, only Methodist, whatever your denomination is, like if you're not in this denomination, you're going to hell. You're wrong. You're not a believer. Yeah, of course, that's extreme. Of course, that's bad. That would be disunity to a very dangerous degree. I know no Baptist, Presbyterians, Methodist, Anglicans that say that. None. Not a one. Never heard one. Right? I've heard some King James onlyist say that, but there's a whole lot of other reasons they're crazy. Right? So I think that he's coming at an issue at a different angle. And I, I think he's coming at it at a wrong angle. I think he's he's wanting to strive for unity so bad that he's pulling scripture out of context, like First Corinthians chapter three, the temple. We are the temple. There's a lot of context about uh, really sexual behavior there that is really being pulled from that as well. Uh, Philippians, again, I think there's unity contextually there within that particular church he's talking about. Uh, and then Matthew, we've already talked about as well. So we got about, let, let's, we, this isn't too much longer, about seven minutes worth. Let's let him finish this up. And there is an opportunity because I guarantee you right now for people under 30 I bet you 80% of the Baptists don't want to be called Baptists anymore. 80% of the evangelicals in that age range don't want to be called or labeled evangelical. Who wants to be called a Presbyterian anymore? How many people even know what these things mean anymore? There's such a hunger and the young people because they're looking at this book and saying, why can't we just be one? Why can't we just be the church? And I'm not saying I have the answer of how this is all going to come together. I just want to stand before God and said, I did my part. I ran on that field and I screamed at the top of my lungs. I may have looked like a lunatic. And I just wonder if we all scream for this unity that Christ died for, could we see it in our lifetime? We're seeing amazing things happen through illuminations and the Bible, you know, translation groups coming together and it's like, whoa, we're actually getting the scripture in every language because we work together. There's just power in this. There's examples of this. And as I have joined forces with people and denominations that sometimes we've got to work through some things and we're still not totally there, but as we've fought for that because we see the Holy Spirit in each other's lives, God's been blessing it. It's not without its attacks and the price, but it's happening. And... I really believe we could see this, that this is something God is doing. He's humbling us right now with all of our different brandings and people are getting tired of it and we're just hungry enough now to be that united church. So I praise God that all of you guys are together here, but I, I don't know what my part is in all of this and I don't know what your part in, is in all of this. I just know the heart of God from reading the scriptures, that Christ died, that we'd be perfectly one, and his promise that the world will believe that Christ sent, was sent from the Father, the world will believe that we're actually loved by God, and the world will even believe in their own judgment when the church becomes one. It's the word of God. So I'm going to pray, you guys, and I, I take this seriously. This is not just a way to end my message. If we believe that Almighty God hears me right now, and I'm going to ask him from heaven to release something into your inner being, a hunger for unity, a desire to break down all these divisions, and wisdom in your part in it, I believe you're about to receive something. I really do. So 
you would bow your heads. Okay, so he goes into prayer after this. So one of the things that this does seem to be, like where he's preaching at, it seems to be some sort of um, maybe a, a dinner, a conference, where a bunch of different denominations come together for the purpose of, you know, of um, unity. <laughs> um, so a couple things we need to ask before we wrap this up. One, did he read the text? Yes and no. Again, he read sections of them, sections that would fit in with what he was going for. But I would argue that within those sections, sort of pulling them out of context in regards to making them fit what he was talking about, even though within context, that's not necessarily what was happening with all three texts, Matthew, Philippians, and 1 Corinthians. Though we didn't really read 1 Corinthians, it was more of a reference. Uh, did he expound on the text? Well, no, because he didn't actually preach from them. Now, again, I don't want to harp on him too much on this, but I still think it applies even at like a sort of a dinner like this where they're talking with a bunch of different denominations. He still could have expounded on the text in regards to what the text meant, the background of them, the implications of that, didn't do any of that. And therefore, when he gets to application, he really draws his own application out, making the text say what he wanted it to say when contextually it's not quite what was going on. Uh, and then lastly, did he preach the gospel? Um, he didn't outright, um, but again, I think that's setting. He's talking to what I presume to be a bunch of pastors from a, different, a bunch of different denominations, though he does mention Jesus uh, you know, wanting to unify us, though he doesn't talk about the death, resurrection, life, none of that of Jesus Christ. So I'm still going to go no on that. Um, now, I don't want to get you know too hard on him and say, oh, he missed all these points, so therefore it's bad. I think what is... Because this wasn't a sermon to a congregation, I am going to give a little bit more grace here um, in regards to being like stick sticking strictly to these. However, I think the the reality that he used the scriptures and he used them in a way that wasn't contextually appropriate to how they were written or what they were talking about, I would say there's a problem there. Overall, this would be my takeaway. Okay, Chan really, 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 really wants unity uh, amongst believers. But he seems to think that denominations and differences of opinions on secondary issues are, are, are very problematic. And therefore, you know, we have, he mentioned at the end there that, you know, what do you say? Under, people under 30 don't like denominations. They don't want to be, have, be labeled. They don't want all that. And that's true. You talk to anybody under 30, and in general, they hate labels. They hate denom like the whole denominational idea. But here's the irony in this. If what Chan wants to happen happens, right? And you have a bunch of believers that say, we love Jesus and they all come together. And they say, we love Jesus and we want to follow the scriptures. Even if that were to happen, what is inevitably going to happen is the same thing that happened in the early church, same thing that happened in the Protestant Reformation, same thing that happened in the early 1900s with all these denominations sort of coming about, um, is that you have people that read the scriptures and they go, okay, well, this says, a, this says this about baptism. Well, this guy over here goes, yeah, but I read the same thing, but that's not what it says about baptism. So now you have two people that, have, that love Jesus, but have two different opinions on baptism. And you have somebody over here and they're like, hey, this says something about women preachers. And this person goes, well, that's not what it really means about women preachers. And now you have two different opinions on women preachers. And then you have somebody going over here, well, hey, in here, this is how the Spirit, you know, you have to have signs, wonders, and tongues to be a believer. And this person goes, that's not what that means. Over, That's not what that means. And so you, you, even if what Chan wants to happen happens, and there's this great unity among people, people that say, I love Jesus, I want to follow the scriptures, you do too, there inevitably comes a point where you have to say, yeah, but like, this is what the scriptures are saying, even though this guy over here is going to say, yeah, but I disagree that that's what it's saying. There is a way to have unity in difference. I think this is explained greatly, and I hope this has happened to you. This has happened to me a thousand times. I love it every time it happens, where I'm at work or I'm out doing my job in the public because I don't just stay in one place, and I meet somebody, and I find out that they are a believer. In that moment, I don't really care about the secondary things at all. I'm just stoked that I met somebody else whose life has been transformed by the power of Jesus' resurrection. That's what I'm excited about. You love Jesus. I love Jesus. My life was changed. Your life was changed. That's 
like, I just like celebrating that talking about, you know, their testimony, how God brought them out of their sin, what happened, like what that looks like, what that meant downstream for them. Like those are the amazing things. Now in those friendships, as they develop, yeah, we start talking about secondary things. But as believers, healthy believers, we don't let secondary things divide us in a way that says, oh, well, you're not a Christian because you believe baptism works this way, right? Or you're not a believer because you think that, you know, women pastors do this, that, or the other. I think we can have very healthy, lively, bordering on very loud discussions on these issues, but come back to the, the, the position in which we say, you love Jesus I just think you're confused. And they say the same thing about us. I think one of the best examples of this type of friendship uh, is uh, when R.C. Sproul was alive. R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur do not see baptism the same way at all. Don't see head coverings the same way at all. But they were really good friends. And I think maybe Francis Chan, because he was he was sort of in the Young Wrestles Reform movement when it was coming up, and then he kind of went over to the charismatic side. And like all of, there was a bunch of fighting within Young Less Restless and Reformed. And then when he went over to sort of a charismatic Pentecostal, he got caught a lot of flack for that. And I think that's influencing sort of how he's seeing the unity in the church because he's such a high profile figure and he's sort of getting shot at from a thousand different directions. So he sees disunity and this is just my guess, he's seen disunity where it's not really disunity. It's just like, like lively discussions, sometimes admittedly taken too far. Lively discussions on secondary things, even though I would say you're, you're, you love Jesus. Now, again, there are people that I've mentioned before, just to kind of give an example of this, that he mentioned as far as the sin conference, that I have some very serious issues with. So Todd White, is really good friends with Kenneth Copeland. We did a review, sermon review on Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland's theology, in my opinion, everything I've seen of it, there are some very problematic parts that 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 like border on heretical. And that's an issue. That's where we go, yep, not gonna, nope, not gonna call you a brother because little God doctrine. I'm gonna go, nope, that's nope, that's not a that you are outside of the cafeteria whenever you start preaching little God doctrine. So those are the things that I think, and some of you, to, to, make, to sort of end this video, some of you are like, what's little God doctrine? Exactly. We just don't preach enough or teach enough or disciple well enough on church history and heresies for us to understand that there are some people outside of the faith that are claiming they're inside. So whenever we, there are people within this same cafeteria going, you, you don't belong in this cafeteria. There's people over here that don't know church history, don't know uh, theology well enough to understand heresy and not heresy. So they think that the person saying to the other person, you're not supposed to be in this cafeteria. They think that person is being mean, unchristlike. When that person actually does, contrary to what Francis Chan said earlier in the sermon, they actually do fear God. And that's exactly why they're saying you're a heretic. You don't hold an orthodox belief. You need to get out of the cafeteria. Um, and all of this confusion has led us to a point where we're uneducated on what we actually believe. And therefore, we think that even the littlest disagreement is problematic when actually it's very necessary for us to have these conversations and to know what we believe on secondary issues. Because even if we get to the point, again, where everybody's so disillusioned with denominations and so tired of people you know, bickering online... That they're like, we just need to get back to all believing and loving in Jesus. The issue is there already is this unity in believing and loving in Jesus. But there are always going to be these secondary issues that you sort of contend over. You also see that in the early church. You see that happening. Um, as theologies are more, you know, become more solidified and the basic beliefs become like very foundational, then these other things start getting worked out. So anyway, there's that. So hopefully, I know this is a little bit different of a sermon review than normal because it wasn't really a sermon, but I hope that you could get a little bit out of that in the sense of at least what we're looking for and listening for when people are talking about the Bible, about Jesus, about unity. I took quite a few 
a little bit of notes here, as you can see. Um, and that's the whole point of that paper is to do that and sort of think through that. So if you, if you like this format, you're interested in this format, the playlist for the sermon reviews will be down in the description. There should also be some boxes on the side for you to check out the last sermon review before this, as well as the playlist. Hopefully you enjoy those. Thank you for watching this all the way through. I'll talk to you next week.